There we go. Hey guys, we welcome go. to the fourth edition of Lunch Hour. Uh, my name is Chris Sparks and I'm the founder of the Forcing Function. Lunch Hour is a monthly conversation series about the boundaries of performance and exploring who is um, on those boundaries and trying to deconstruct how they live that fashion. Um, now, the forcing function, in addition to hosting online workshops like this one, um, does what I like to call performance training. And our current offering is a three-month program for 12 investors and executives in meaningful companies. Um, we're also excited to launch uh, group coaching for the first time in September. So if you're interested in either of those, I um, encourage you to check out our website, theforcingfunction.com. Um, for those of you guys who uh, know Nat but are unfamiliar with what we do, I would point you to a couple of resources. Um, the first being our workbook. Uh, so this is Experiment Without Limits. Um, we actually mailed out a lot of these to uh, 15 countries last week. Um, and it's, it's really the biggest distillation of what I have learned in the past few years in terms of what makes a peak performer. So designing systems that make what you want to do easier to do, um, creating habits and routines that allow you to be your best self. How do you optimize your time, your attention, your energy? And finally, and I think most importantly, how do you learn how to learn? And that is why I have Nat here today. Uh, if I could describe Nat in one word, it would be prolific. Uh, Nat has a super knack for getting up to speed extremely quickly. And you could say he goes from zero to 60, where he has an idea and he is really good at building those feedback loops, creating that flywheel so that he creates momentum around a new project. Um, another way of thinking this could be the Peter Thiel metaphor of going from zero to one is that you have something that you want to do, but you haven't started it yet, you're at zero. How do you boil water, get over that threshold from going from zero to one? It's a verb change. I'd like to do something, I'm going to do something to, I am doing something. How do you go from zero to one? And that's what our conversation is gonna be about. I think Matt has been more successful at going from zero to 60, going from zero to one than any of my other friends and I would love to try to deconstruct what allows him to do that. What is his learning process? And how do you make output feel more effortless? Now, um, now Nat and I met over sushi here in New York City um, while that was still a thing. Uh, and when I was living in Austin earlier this year, um, you know, Nat built a cafe for his Cup and Leaf Tea brand. And his cafe was one of my favorite places in Austin to work and hang. And so hopefully that, that space will be open up again soon, crossing fingers. And so if you're passing through Austin, definitely recommend you know, stopping in and saying, hey. Um, a couple things about Nat, you know, bio-wise, uh, he's, he's got a lot of projects in the portfolio. Um, most notably, he's the uh, founder and CEO of Growth Machine, which is a SEO-focused content agency. Um, he's the founder of Cup and Leaf, which is a boutique uh, online and physical tea brand. Um, some of you guys know he um, created a course recently called Effortless Output with Rome, which teaches um, personal knowledge management um, in Rome research. And um, finally, he's been publishing a fantastic newsletter for a number of years um, called Monday Medley. Um, so if you're interested in signing up for that, that's on his website, nateliason.com slash join. A um, couple more forcing function resources I'll mention here before we kick things off. Um, we also have uh, the performance assessment. And so um, with getting started with a project or otherwise, it's difficult to know what your biggest opportunities for growth are. And so we created a quiz that would illuminate what that biggest opportunity is for you. You can take that for free at theforcingfunction.com slash assessment. And finally, we do these once a month. Um, this is the fourth one we've done so far. So we've been with uh, venture capitalist Steve Schlafman. We've been with um, other uh, PKM uh, masters, Tiago Forte and Kehi. Um, so Tiago, we are talking about uh, 
how do you create an online course? What's the fastest path from zero to 100K? Um, with, uh, with Kehi, we were talking about what are the systems for building a good life, which I think touches on some of the themes that I hope to discuss today. How can you, you know, money aside, make sure that you're, you're living a good life, doing things that every day make you feel like you're growing, feeling more fulfilled. Um, so if you're interested in checking out those questions, those uh, conversations, the, the full videos and transcript are available online, theforcingfunction.com slash lunch hour, lunch dash hour. A um, couple housekeeping items, as you guys can see, uh, their chat is open. Glad you guys are in there. Um, we, uh, you know, recommend the default is all panelists. So if you're something you want to say to the whole group, change that to all panelists and attendees. Now, um, we're going to be here until 1.15 Eastern. Uh, this can be a 30 minute conversation between Nat and I, and then we're going to open it up to Q&A. Um, so if you have to leave early, no worries. Um, we're going to be recording this and you're, everyone who registered is going to get an email from Zoom in two days. So noon Eastern on Friday with a link to the um, video audio recording as well as the transcript. Um, so you have to bail. No worries. We'll, we'll carry on without you. Um, now, if you'd like to ask a question and please do. Um, use the Q&A function. You can see it on the bottom bar. I see a couple people have already found it. And I'm going to be asking those questions at the, the tail half of this discussion on your behalf. And the way that I know which questions you guys want answered is using the upvote function. So if someone else asked a question, you're like, oh, that's interesting. I'd like to hear what Nat has to say on that. Upvote that question so increase the chances of getting answered. All right. Well, I think I'm ready to kick things off. What do you think, Nat? I think we're ready. Awesome. So. I would like to start, um, you know, would love to hear a little bit about your background and, you know, the context of today's conversation. Um, what do you remember maybe a moment or an activity where you discovered that you could learn how to learn and that this could be a competitive advantage that would carry over to anything else you want to do? Yeah, I've, I talk about this kind of off and on on Twitter occasionally. But uh, I haven't really written anything up about it, which I should at some point. But through pretty much until my sophomore year of college, I spent almost all of my time on uh, video games. So that was kind of like the main thing that I was focused on and like cared about doing well in. I kind of always did the bare minimum to do well in school. Uh, and I think I was fortunate that I like just had access to really good education and was kind of like smart enough that I could just go in and wing it on tests and like get a 81 or something and like, you know, do, do well enough to pass and have okay grades without having to like spend a ton of time. Uh, very like, you know, Pareto optimal studying where it was like, all right, I'd rather just pay like 10, 15% or spend 10, 15% of the time and, you know, get the, get the B versus like trying to get, uh, trying to get to the, the A. So uh, it was all about like maximizing time I could spend on video games, probably spending like at least four to six hours a day. Uh, and for a hot sec, I was even on like my college's competitive Dota team, which was like kind of a fun experience. Uh, but the that was actually kind of where I first got interested in this idea of like learning how to learn or like self-education to become better at things because I was playing with a bunch of friends who I knew from high school primarily. And for the most part, uh, I was usually able to, or I was very competitive with them and I wanted to progress faster than them, but without spending as much time playing as them. Uh, and that's when I kind of discovered uh, Twitch streaming, right? So going on Twitch and like watching pros play. Uh, and that, you know, so I was playing a lot of StarCraft II back then. And I realized that if instead of spending like four hours just playing and like doing the same thing I was always doing, if I spent, you know, a couple hours watching pros play and then a couple hours like going into the game and trying to duplicate the strategies they were doing, that actually helped me move up like a lot faster in rankings than just like this blind uh, repetition. And uh, Anders Ericsson has a really good book on this called Peak. And he's the guy who invented the concept of deliberate practice uh, that got sort of like misappropriated by Malcolm Gladwell and Outliers. Uh, I'd strongly recommend reading Peak. Malcolm Gladwell like gets a 
very wrong uh, in his representation. But uh, one of the things that uh, Erickson points out in the book is that like there are these concepts about, or th there are these concepts of like naive practice and like deliberate practice. And in naive practice, you're, you know, you're like going to play tennis with your friends, right? Like you're, you're playing tennis and you could do that for 10,000 hours and you wouldn't necessarily get any better at it. But if you're doing a more deliberate kind of practice, you're like actually studying elements to get better at and figuring out where the weaknesses are and then like working on improving on them. So, you know, for me, I kind of like discovered it by just like way of experience, realizing that I could learn a lot faster by watching these pros play and then going and trying to implement their techniques. And then uh, I eventually stopped playing as much StarCraft, started playing more Dota. And uh, as like a, a very high level overview in, in Dota, there's sort of like three or four main types of roles you can play. And most people specialize in one of those four roles where they're either like what's called the carry where you start off really weak and then you come in at the end of the game and like win it for your team. You're like the support where you're helping keep everyone alive and helping make sure your teammates don't die. And you're usually the one to like sacrifice yourself to preserve a more important teammate's life. Um, there's what's called like mid. So you're either like you're in the middle of the game and you're really good in the middle of the game, but you might like get weaker towards the end. Like most people pick one area and they focus on that. But I found that I could get a lot better at each role by like getting really good at the other roles and then coming back and applying those knowledges to like figuring out how to better support the other members of the team by getting better at their respective roles. So it's kind of like this other interesting uh, area where it's like maybe specialization isn't always the best way to get really good at something. Sometimes like blending in a certain level of generality actually helps you improve within your specialization. Uh, and so trying to find kind of that balance was really good because again it's like not always just about like hammering on this one thing it's about like figuring out where else you can go to get useful knowledge and then bring it back to the core thing you're trying to improve on uh and then what i usually say is like eventually the computer video games just got kind of like boring and less motivating uh less interesting like they, they weren't a sufficiently inf infinite game, I suppose. Uh, and that was where I think some of the entrepreneurship stuff came in, where it was like that, that to me was like such a, a much more interesting, more challenging game, given, you know, there's really no constraints on the rules uh, that you get much more interesting, like real life spoils from being good at it. Uh, there's always like new things to learn and new challenges. Um, and it just sort of like tr started transferring over from video games into the like entrepreneurship, blogging, SEO, like I think of a lot of SEO and marketing as its own kind of video game, I think. Uh, and so I never really got over that addiction, so to speak. I just managed to transfer it into a different realm. Thanks, Nat. Uh, man, it really re reminds me a lot of the process of becoming uh, a really good poker player. Uh, I, was, I was a bit of a competitive gamer, but in uh, much bluer oceans, uh, my game was uh, Microsoft Ants. It was an like, early version of uh, StarCraft <laughs> and Dota. Uh, yeah. And, uh, and it's, it's cool what you talk about as far as specialization being overrated. And it's something that I see a lot in competitive pursuits like poker is that if, if you have a weak point, something that you're not comfortable with, um, that weak point tends to be exposed. And you find yourself um, avoiding this, this sense of discomfort. And um, that being comfortable with not knowing, being comfortable with a beginner and being on the frontiers of knowledge, uh, I think this is a really good mindset to have. Because um, you know, it's, it's like they talk about um, with uh, the cons and that, that they always were on the move, always, um, always exploring new, new lands because the second that they settled down and got comfortable, that's when the civilization started to become weak. And that in order to continue improving and remain strong, needing to continually be exploring these new domains. Um, and that specialization carried the seeds of, of just ultimate demise. Um, and on this theme of teams and being part of a team, playing a role, um, knowing that in many pursuits, we're not flying solo. There are others who we know 
who can help us achieve what we want to achieve. And that's something that I've learned. And I know, you know, you have a lot of practice at this point delegating to a team as far as if you want to accomplish anything of sufficient scale, you need to recruit and work with others to get there. Um, I would love to hear, you know, what you've done as far as tapping into your network for expertise, right? This notion that we don't need to be an expert in everything, that there's people who we know who can help illuminate these blind spots and accelerate our learning curve. Um, what, what have you done to kind of build relationships and tap into your network to accelerate some of these projects? Yeah, I've been thinking about this more recently because I think that the, the traditional concept of networking is kind of uh, weak, right? Or like what you learn in college about like, oh, you need to like build your network and like add people on LinkedIn and, you know, congratulate them on their new role. Like all of that kind of bullshit doesn't really build uh, relationships. And, you know, you can do it right, especially when you're young uh, and either in college or just out of college, and you can reach out to people and say, you know, like, hey, I have nothing to offer you really, but I'm super interested in what you're doing. And if I could talk to you for 15, 30 minutes, that would be, you know, I'd, it means so much to me. And like that, that works for a while. But I think eventually as you kind of move up in whatever you're trying to do, I, a lot of like professional relationship building and uh, being able to learn from other people comes from like working together on things, right? And like, uh, for lack of a better word, like hiring uh, your friend's expertise for stuff as relevant. So, uh, you know, I've, I, I'm really fortunate now where you get to a certain point in working in any kind of business where you can like afford to hire people to like help you learn things. And there's kind of like the, these multiple levels to it. Cause when you're just starting out in pretty much anything, you sort of have to do all the self-education yourself. Right. And there are lots of good ways to do that. You can get pretty far doing it on your own, just from like books and experimentation. It's going to be a lot harder in some fields than others based on like the budget you need to start learning how to do something. But for a lot of the valuable skills today, you can get yourself to a, you know, fairly competent, very high five figure, low six figure salary, just like on your own reading and messing around uh, in your free time. Right. So, and then once you're kind of at a point where you can do your own area very well, it eventually becomes less efficient to try to teach yourself everything. Right. Because you, you can go the self-education route and try to like find the right books and uh, find the right projects and do it all yourself. But it eventually, it's like, as your time gets more and more valuable, and you and I've talked about this too, right? Like $1,000 an hour time. Uh, as your time gets more and more valuable, it starts making less and less sense for you to do things that you're bad at, right? Because even though it might be cool to like learn that new skill, if, if you can make, you know, $250 an hour effectively, or like, that's a lot. If you can make like $100 an hour doing programming or something, it might not make sense for you to spend... 20 hours or 25 hours learning marketing when you could just make, you know, two grand in that time and like hire somebody to do whatever it is you're trying to do for you. Right. So eventually you get into this weird trade off where it's like, all right, I really want to learn this thing, but uh, it's like financially inefficient and unproductive even for me to like learn it on my own. So how do you like bridge that gap? And the thing that I've been trying to do more of is like, uh, building good relationships with people who are experts in their own domain and then uh, doing some combination of either like hiring them and just letting them do it and then like me getting to like ride along and see what they're doing and getting exposed to it that way or you know doing some some kind of like skill trade or like sharing amongst us um, and like getting you know getting access to their brain and their talent through that and you know like giving them something that i'm good at in return instead of me trying to get good at like both of those things uh this is kind of a funny example but i think it's really nice uh my friend here in austin um katherine lavery she's the founder of best self which makes a lot of like really good like productivity um tools and like conversation starting decks and things like that and she in her former life she was actually an architect so she used to like design buildings and everything. And I, when, when we moved uh, or when she moved into her house here in Austin, she like designed this beautiful like backyard deck fence setup, whatever. And then she eventually found some local guys who could build it for her. Uh, and then after they finished building hers, she actually uh, like offered to design our backyard for us. And then I did some like SEO work and help for her uh, in exchange. And so it was really fun because it's like, she's this incredible artist and can do these cool like 
3D mock-ups of the house and layout and whatnot. And then like I got to see her doing that and how she was thinking about laying out space and like organizing principles of an area, like things that I know nothing about. And, you know, in exchange, I was able to help her like set up a few of these um, processes and do some of this research for um, her site. And then, you know, going out and like hiring people to build out the backyard, it's like learning some carpentry through them and seeing how they're doing things and like getting to talk with them about, you know, why I do things this way or that way versus just like trying to go out and do it yourself. It's like you can start to kind of like jumpstart a lot of the education process. And then also in doing it, you kind of like start to build up this network of experts which is one of the like most valuable things that you can do in I think like any professional domain is like the the quality and the number of experts you have access to who you can go to with questions about anything and who you can like refer out to friends is like one of the most valuable things that I think you can have because if you can build you know one if you can build a network of people who you can like learn from and ask questions to and like tap into and who you can share your knowledge with that's great for you but then it also makes you more valuable to like other people right if people know that you're always going to know somebody good for them to talk to for like anything else that they want to learn like i had this conversation with my personal trainer last week where he he said something where he was like oh you know you guys it looks like you were starting to get some plants for the backyard like you know what kind of plants did you decide to get or like how did you pick them and i was like oh well like we actually have another friend who's like a plant consultant who <laughs> will like <laughs> go into your backyard or house and she'll like you know sketch up the area and like lay out how, you know what plants you should have based on like the light profile and the water profile and she like gives all these recommendations and he was like man you like actually have a person for like literally everything uh he's like that's pretty cool and i hadn't thought about it but i was like yeah it's it's like a super valuable thing and like it makes the learning process so much easier and uh, it like allows you to bring a lot of value to other people's lives as well. So like realizing when you should start making that transition from doing like full self education, uh, like figure everything out yourself to like finding and sourcing experts. And even if you can't afford to pay them, like what can you offer them in return to help them like jumpstart your learning process? That's where you can really get into these like really quick self-education cycles, right? And you might not even, you might not be able to hire them at all, but if you can even just watch them work, right? Like kind of like watching the professional gamers on Twitch, uh, you can pick up a lot just by osmosis and seeing what they're doing that you might not be doing. Yeah, thanks. It, it reminds me of this frame that I try to have whenever I meet someone new um, around, you know, how can I, rather than trying to be interesting and impress someone, how can I be interested in them? And what helps is to know that everyone is an expert in something. Um, and the thing that we're an expert in, we tend to think like, oh, well, like, yeah, that's no big deal. Like anyone could do that. Like, you know, who cares about, you know, the right types of plants to have? Like, yeah, that's not really, but like, if you, if you take this frame of, like what is this person's kind of hidden superpower? What are they really passionate about? What are they an expert in? Um, not only can you learn something really interesting, people generally love talking about what they're passionate about, what they spend a lot of time learning, you never know when that indirect connection, right? Sharing that knowledge um, can be useful to someone else. And it's a really easy way to add lots of value to others by being that node in that knowledge network bridging those gaps as you put it um, so that's super cool to you know build friendships around that what are you passionate about what do you like doing um, how can we help each other because we don't need to know how to do everything we're all on the same path um, and I think that that's really key to these these self-education cycles because knowledge is no longer the bottleneck we we know if we don't know ourselves we know someone who can at least help us get to that next stage. Um, you know, I think this touches on a really important values question um, that, um, you know, Kay and I talked about, and I, would, I know, you know, we've talked about it as well. I'd love to hear your perspective because um, what comes across as you're, as you're talking is if you're, if you're strictly focused on the bottom line, right, efficiency as value, we would only do the thing that we're best at and delegate 
everything else. Like why become good at something that we can't become the best at? But what I see in your life is that you're driven a lot about what interests you and what you're passionate about. And you don't need to become an expert, but that you get good enough in order to either get the project started and hand it off or to learn enough so that you can effectively delegate. And it seems like it creates this trade-off where we're doing things that might not be the most efficient, right? It's maybe not the highest expected hourly, but we drive a lot of, you know, happiness and fulfillment from getting better at things. Um, how, how do you, how do you make those, those trade-offs? How do you decide, Hey, I know this isn't the most important or highest leverage thing for me to be doing, but I'd like to learn anyways. How do you, how do you navigate that? Yeah, I think, you know, there's probably not a, a perfect answer for it, but it would have something to do with resonance, right? Where it's like, is this, you know, do I, am I excited about learning how to do this? And is it something that I think I'm going to, you know, keep doing into the future, right? Uh, as like a really simple example, we needed to pour a concrete slab for our backyard. And for a few days, I was like, oh, like, let's learn how to, you know, pour concrete and, you know, buy the materials for it and try doing it ourselves. And then, you know, started looking into it more. And it was like, man, am I like ever going to do this again? Or am I just, is it going to be better to just let a pro do it? Right. And there just like, wasn't very much resonance there with learning how to do it. It just seemed like, oh, maybe this would be cool. And so we decided like, no, we should just hire it out. Right. Whereas for growth machine, you know, we do like SEO and content marketing and link building and there's no like really great tools out there for managing a link building process at scale. You can like hack it together from other tools, but <clears throat> there's like no great uh, software out there for it because it's such a niche uh, need. So I've, you know, I, I did a little bit of programming off and on throughout the years and I've been picking it back up in the last few months so that I can actually like build us a tool we can use uh, for managing our link building process and make it a lot more efficient. Right. Because something that pretty much always has resonance for me is like efficiency and like maximizing individual output for like minimal input Right, because I, I think uh, I was thinking about this the other day, and I, I haven't figured out the best way to articulate it yet. But I think that the one of the ideal like uh, character combinations, I guess, for like an entrepreneur is being very motivated and very lazy. Because if you're very motivated, you're going to like really want to make stuff happen. But if you're very lazy, you're going to figure out ways to make that stuff happen like a lot faster or without you like repeatedly doing things. And uh, it can be hard sometimes to, or what you want to avoid is kind of like doing the same thing over and over again and like not getting better at it, right? And that's sort of where like, or not, not so not getting better at it, but like wasting time doing repeated processes where like for me, I'm, I'm always very motivated to like cut out steps of the process while retaining quality, uh, find ways to like outsource, automate, right? Like I have well over a hundred zaps set up in Zapier, like running different processes at the company. Uh, it's like probably my favorite tool. Um, and so for me, that's just like an area where I have a lot of resonance where if I can learn how to do something that's going to save me or the people I work with a ton of time and energy, like that's super high value. Um, whereas like other areas, it just might not be there. And so I'm going to default to like hiring out help or letting somebody else handle it. And so I think, you know, especially if you're doing something entrepreneurial, like finding the areas where you have some amount of like resonance where you can focus on and keep learning and then finding people who resonate in like other areas where you don't and working with them. Uh, that's like a really good way to cover your weaknesses because it's like nothing's necessarily better or worse. Right. But uh, you need to find people who can cover some of those other important areas where you know, you're going to fall short. Right. Like, I have a lot of weaknesses as a professional, like as a working person, as like a team member, whatnot. Uh, and so creating systems to help cover those and then like hiring people who are good at the things that I'm not is way better than trying to like, I don't know, overly force myself into becoming someone I'm not. Uh, I feel like it's probably the best way to frame it. What does resonance feel like? Uh, I would say that it's the it like you do it when you should be doing work that has deadlines right so like productive procrastination yeah productive procrastination is probably the best way to frame it where it's like okay i know i should be doing this other stuff that's like in my asana to-do list but i want to work on this right now and like 
long term, you know, this is going to have high value, even if it's not urgent right now, right? So it's the it's the not urgent important stuff that actually manages to crowd out the urgent important stuff, right? Because I think like the thing you want to avoid is like there's a lot of non urgent important things that are probably on your plate but if they're not getting done it's not just because they're not urgent it might also be because you just don't actually care about them that much and they're just things you feel like you should do or like you're supposed to do and those might be things where you should like hire someone to help you know get you across that threshold right it's like uh you and i talked about this chris when we were working together it was like hiring a personal trainer was such a big thing because it's like the issue for me wasn't uh working out necessarily it was doing the programming for working out and like deciding what i was going to do when i go to the gym and like figuring all of that out and just having somebody manage that process for me was such a huge like force multiplier right it's like i signed up for a personal trainer and then like ran my first marathon six months later right it was like that was the by far the biggest bottleneck was just like having somebody doing the programming for me it wasn't getting to the gym so finding those areas of your life where it's sort of like kept, keeps getting pushed off or it's like, oh yeah, no, I like, I care about this. I want to do it. Like it's important, but never gets done. It's like, you probably don't actually want to do that thing and you should find a way to like get somebody else to handle it so that you can actually do the stuff that is making you push back your other to-dos. I love that. Uh, trying to reveal what are the things that subconsciously or emotionally we feel pulled to do. Um, but that maybe giving ourselves permission to pursue that. Um, I really key into that word should when I hear someone use it um, in a conversation is we have to realize that we have a lot of latitude in the projects that we choose to take on, right? There, if we think about this in like a two by two in terms of like need to do and you know want to do, there are things that we definitely don't want to do that, but that we need to do, right? And, you know, think about it's like taxes, payroll, um, that sort of stuff. Um, but within the things that we pursue, especially as a, as a business owner, but even as an executive in a company, we have a lot of latitude in what we do day to day. And sometimes we can get, we can have, you know, artificial blinders on and get trapped in doing the things that, we think we should be doing, we're plowing forward rather than what are the things that we want to do and we kind of need to give ourselves permission there. Um, so kind of leaning into that as you, as you put it and discovering that there are many paths to the top of the mountain and a lot of times rather than going uphill and slogging up that mountain, we can kind of go downhill and instead of, I like the way that you put that it feels more effortless um, it's something that I discovered with poker is like, wow, I, I found something that I can make money doing that doesn't feel like work. I could just, someone has to pull me off of the table, right? Yeah. You, you, you drop like the word addiction, right? I think a lot of like the difference between like addiction and passion and compulsion and mission, there was, there was words are all kind of interchangeable. They're just, you know, cultural labels on something that we enjoy doing for its own sake. And I think that's a good thing to think about as entrepreneurs, as executives, is what are the things that we do for their own merit? What do we put off doing other things so we could spend more time doing? And is there a way to pull value out of that, even if it's just sharing that work with others? Um, I think this is a great time to, to talk about the blog and I think your process for sharing your own work um, for those of you guys who, who don't know, I'm going to share a little bit of background about Nat. Um, you know, when we met, I think you remember on the lake house in Alabama, this was, Nat had been blogging on his website, I think for over a year, um, just it's building like an audience, writing, at that point. Yeah. yeah, multiple years of just writing on everything that he was reading and learning, just continually sharing that process on a variety of topics, everything under the sun, anything that interested him and made him feel, feel fulfilled. His just natural process of, of learning, repurposing that into assets, into content, kind of documenting that process. Even before he started Growth Machine, he was already learning that value of SEO-driven content and you know, opening up the kimono, sharing that process. Um, you know, I would love to hear about how that feels for you. Why do, why do you think it's important to share your work? Yeah. I. It's a, it's a good question. I mean, 
I started the blog back in 2014 and I started it because I, I knew roughly that I wanted to go into content marketing uh, of some sort, but I needed a portfolio to show to companies who I wanted to work for. So I made the blog so I could start putting a few articles on it. And then I used those articles to reach out to companies I wanted to write for. Uh, the first two companies I reached out to were Buffer and Zapier. So like I didn't, <laughs> it's like two of the best content marketing sites online, right? Like I, in retrospect, it was like a pretty bold move that I just assumed I could get one of those right off the Zapier actually bit and they hired me as a freelance writer. And so I did a couple articles for them and then ended up interning for them. Um, and so that was like right from the beginning, it was clear that using the blog to share knowledge was like a huge uh, like leverage point for my career. And then a number of months later, I started learning more about SEO and started like getting up the SEO for the site and then started monetizing the site more. And then there was a point after like two ish years of working on it where it was making, you know, like a modest enough income. It was making like maybe three grand a month, but that was enough, like, and it was totally passive. And that was enough for me to go live in Argentina for a little bit and like not really have to work on anything and do the whole like four hour work week passive income lifestyle for a bit. Um, which like gets pretty boring and sucks after like six months. So I don't recommend it as a goal, but it was still cool to hit that point. Um, and that was like everything on the blog was really just like, Hey, I'm interested in this thing. I'm going to go learn some more about this thing. And then I'm going to write about this thing. Uh, or it was, Hey, I've been interested in this thing for a while. I've learned a lot about this. Like, let me share it with you. Uh, and my style on the blog has always been to try to do just like one big post on each topic, you know, when it makes sense. So I've got like really just one main article on like how to be productive. And I have like one main article on how to make passive income. I have one main article on like, you know, growing a blog. And like, I try to do these like big mega posts distilling a bunch of knowledge on something to make it super useful. And that's like paid off super well, right? I think that it's allowed me to build a little bit of a reputation on the site of like providing very good information, contrary to like what most other blogs do. Uh, and that's sort of like, let me build a bit of an audience there. And same thing with the newsletter, right? Where my newsletter is not, you know, Hey, I just like published this post, like go check it out and leave a comment. It's like, Hey, here's all of the, uh, here's all of the like interesting things that I'm reading. And then like new things that I'm finding. Here's like some ideas I've been thinking about. Let me know if that fixed the video, by the way. Um, and that's just like worked super well for growing that audience over time. Cause I think that like a lot of blogs try to like position themselves as this like you know, crazy expert, like knows everything, like, you know, you should listen to me, whatever. Uh, and I've always tried to balance between like, okay, I know a decent amount about this thing and I'm going to share that knowledge, but also like, you know, like I don't really know that much about anything and I'm trying to like keep it light. So I think, you know, that's worked really well. And then just sharing the book notes has been huge too. I mean, uh, I've got something like 250, 260 book notes up on the site. Now I've been building that database for the last even longer, like seven years or something. Um, and a lot of those book notes rank on Google when you search like summary of XYZ book. If you search like 48 laws of power summary, I think I'm still like number first three page. or four. Yep. First page, yeah. So it's like there, there's a bunch of those now, uh, which is really cool because it's like SEO really is the force multiplier for a lot of content like that, um, where it's like the, I mean, the site gets something like twelve to 15,000 visitors a day, right? Even if I don't publish for three or four months, it'll still get, you know, twelve to 15,000 visitors every day. And that's like a lot of people. Um, I mean, like my college graduating class, or my, my entire college was 6,000 people. So it's like <laughs> two and a half of my universities like on the site every day. Like it kind of blows my mind a little bit. Um, but it, it's just from like getting interested in stuff and then writing about it and sharing it. And I say this a lot. It's like, like I got me that first marketing internship. It spun out my first like side hustle that I did with a friend in college. It got me my first marketing full-time job. It uh, got me like pretty much all of the little like passive income side things that I have. It started Growth Machine, which is, you know, the marketing agency that I run now that's like, you know, doing a few million in revenue and has like a bunch of employees. It's like it, it, all of it pretty much started there, just like getting interested in things and sharing knowledge. So it's I think it's like one of the highest leverage things you can do as an individual is just like put yourself out there, share what you're learning, 
um, you know, share any takeaways, things that are interesting to you. And over time, kind of like what you were saying before, right? Like, don't try to be interesting, just try to be interested. And by just being interested in stuff other people are interested in, you're naturally going to attract like-minded people. And it's like, I mean, the, the reason you and I are friends is because me and Taylor were friends and me and Taylor were friends because I got intro to him by Scott Britton when I moved to Austin and I met Scott from like something on my blog, right? It's like you and I are also friends because of the blog. It's like it, I can trace back so many things to it, uh, which is like really cool looking back on it six years later. Yeah, I think the opportunities that we receive are proportional to our reputation and that you know, reputation has two elements. The first is, is signal. If is there proof that you say you can do what you that you can do what you say you can do, right? How like you said building out that portfolio. And the other one is being top of mind. And so putting out things regularly, sharing the process, you're continually reinforcing that of someone who's learning, who's doing things. Um, in the VC world, they talk about this as, li as lines, not dots, where if you just meet someone and that they're static, you know, static image of this is where they are now, right? Oh, this person is on their, their tower of expertise, but you don't know how they got there. It's difficult to know where they're going to be in the future versus you're sharing this process and like, oh, it's like, Nat's interested in starting a tea brand. Oh, Nat has a tea brand. Oh, now Nat is starting to build a cafe. And you start to connect these dots and you see, oh, this is a person who does things, who knows how to get things done, who is, is capable in a lot of ways. And I think that's really powerful for building a reputation and increasing the surface area of optionality where opportunities come to you just by notion of having signal, having proof that you can do things and being reminded that you are that person who, oh, I need someone, I need someone who might know a plant consultant. Well, Nat knows a bunch of people who do a bunch of cool things. Let's, let's ask Nat. You know, Nat's super approachable. He's, he doesn't need to establish himself as an expert. He's happy to share that, that process. And I think everyone is a beginner in something and I think everyone's an expert in something. And so it's important to you know, establish that that journey is, is possible. And that's a really big value add for others. Um, you know, maybe it'd be cool to talk about that process of creating Cup and Leaf and, and now the cafe. Um, so I remember it all started as you were having all of this amazing success with clients at Growth Machine but obviously you can't share all of, the, all of that behind the scenes of clients. And so the idea is, well, why don't I just create my own brand and then I could share all of the results along the way. And that led into creating the online site and then, and then the cafe. What was that process like? Yeah, I mean, you, you gave a good summary there where it was really like we needed a good case study to use at Growth Machine for showing to clients, but we can't share that much of like our clients numbers, of course. So we started uh, Cup and Leaf just as a blog, right? To like talk about tea because we saw there was like a big uh, SEO opportunity there. And so we started that and uh, started just like writing about tea and that ended up getting to like 150,000 visitors a month in like eight months, right? Like it grew very quickly. Um, and then as that was growing, <clears throat> uh, my wife and I sort of saw an opportunity to start uh, selling actual tea behind the blog. So if we were bringing in all this traffic and we were sending it to Amazon and Tivana and Harney and Sons and all those, why not actually <clears throat> sell our own tea instead? So we looked into it and figured out sourcing and packaging and like setting up the Shopify store and whatever. And it was something like three or four weeks uh, from deciding that we wanted to do it to actually uh, getting some product and being able to put it up on the site. So we were able to move really quickly there. And then we were able to start plugging everything in from the blog. And then as the blog kept growing, the online sales kept growing. And so we were running that together. Uh, she eventually took over much more of it. And we were doing that for, oh, about a, not even a year, I guess, was it? Yeah, it was like eight or nine months. And then we had moved to Austin. And obviously, real estate in New York is like crazy expensive. But commercial real estate in Austin, slightly more reasonable. So we found like a little spot. Uh, in East Side, our neighborhood that we could rent and kind of renovate into a cafe. And <clears throat> this is where it's like, it can be a little bit dangerous. <clears throat> Sorry, like 
thyroid issues today. This is where it can be a little bit dangerous to be too confident in your ability to like figure stuff out and have it be fine because it's like we really had no idea what we were getting ourselves into. Uh, it's very different to try to like MV, you, you can't MVP something in the real world, right? Like you can MVP uh, an online store, right? Like you can make a minimum viable product in a weekend and like put up the store and get some sales. And you could even do that before you have a product and you could like test it out. But in the real world, like, you have to get permits, you have to do construction, you have to do plumbing. I mean, like one, you know, we, I mean, we just had no idea what we were doing. Like we rented the space without even having like a plumber or electrician come out and do a consult or like having a permitting guy come and look at it and see if it was going to be feasible. We just like got super excited and jumped into it. Uh, and it ended up being like, like a 10 month process to renovate the space to be able to turn it into a cafe. And then two months after all the renovations are done and we're open, uh, COVID hits and we have to shut down, right? It's just like, I mean, and obviously you can't plan for a global pandemic in, you know, starting a business like this, but that's, that's been its whole other like uh, experience, just like dealing with that and learning it. I mean, one example I always give is, uh, you know, we had to plumb in like our sink and our dishwasher and everything, right? So we have the appliances and they're, you know, spaced out in there. And, uh, we had like, I mean, we designed the layout ourselves. We didn't even hire like an architect to design it. We're like, no, we can figure this out. So we, we have it all designed. We have the appliances where it makes the most sense for us. The plumber comes out and starts looking at it. And he's like, he's basically like, Oh, uh, you guys don't have enough fall for the drain. So the drain can't tie into the sewage from here. And we're like, well, what do you mean? He's like, well, you just like, you can't really have appliances in here because there's no way for us to tie in to the sewage. Uh, and we're like, well, there has to be some way. He's like, well, you, you, he's like, okay, there are some ways, but you're not going to like them. Like option number one is <clears throat> you can uh, find like some like day laborers or something who are willing to crawl under the building through the crawl space with very small shovels and dig out the ground under the building so that there's enough room for the pipes to go through to get to the sewage. That's option one. Uh, option two is we can get a jackhammer and blast through this concrete slab in between where your drink area is and where the sewage tie-in is. Uh, and then we can like run the pipe through the concrete slab and then re-pour the concrete on top of it to like lock it in and like fix the aesthetics. Uh, option three is you can go out the other direction and then connect to a sump pump and the sump pump will carry it into the sewage. Uh, and that will have to be like, you know, cleaned and changed every like month or two. Uh, and like any of these options is going to run you like north of $20,000. Uh, and we're just like, <laughs> right. Cause I think we had budgeted like two or three grand for the plumbing. Right. Um, and you know, eventually we did find an alternative solution that was much cheaper and that worked, but we had to talk to like five plumbing companies. Um, so there's just like all these things we had no idea what we we're getting ourselves into. Uh, and you know, I think it, it probably costs north of a hundred thousand dollars to do all the renovations and to get it open, including like all the rent we had to pay for the months that we weren't open. Uh, so you know, we learned a ton, right? But sometimes that instinct to just like, oh, jump in and figure it out as you go is like, maybe not the best instinct, especially if it's in a very foreign domain where the cost of being wrong is very high, right? It's like, that's the biggest lesson here definitely is like, okay, if you're going into a very unfamiliar area, like, be careful, right? And like estimate, I heard this rule somewhere, you know, after we'd already done this, of course, but it was like, you know, budget out what you think the worst case scenario of this endeavor could be in terms of like the money you might lose on it and then spend five to 10% of that evaluating it and seeing if this is actually like a good idea, right? And we were trying to be so budget conscious in the beginning that we didn't really spend much money evaluating the option. We just jumped in. And if we had spent, you know, five or 10 grand on having some experts go out and look at it and, and have them tell us whether or not it was a good idea, they probably would have told us to like find a different spot or, like ask the landlord for more money or things like that, which would have saved us a ton of headaches. So that's been a good lesson there. Uh, and also don't open a cafe before a pandemic uh, if you can avoid it. <laughs> I love that story because it demonstrates so much of this jumping into new domains. 
Um, I like to talk about uh, decision making a lot with my clients and something that I always have them do as an exercise is trying to identify what are the key assumptions. And so in this case, you have a project and you have a timeline and you have a budget, but what are the key assumptions that this timeline and this budget rests upon? And that's where the value of new information, talking to experts like a plumber is the highest because especially when we're jumping into a new domain, some of our assumptions won't be great. Um, you know, we, we try to lean in on the, the outside view. What if, how long have similar projects taken? How, much, how long have similar projects uh, cost? Adding some padding, usually like a multiplier onto that, but saying, well, what is the one thing that if it goes wrong, could double the length of this project or it could double the size of that budget? And that's where you focus that initial learning is trying to trying to disprove this key assumption that you know we have, we're looking at with rosy cover, colored glasses, and I think it really illustrates the truth of a lot of projects is that they're really messy. Um, we we look at things that others have accomplished, and it's it's a little bit intimidating at times. But when you talk to them and you talk about the process. You know, it's often like, hey, like say a successful entrepreneur who has an exit, they're like, wow, we were totally naive to think that we could do that. Like, we had no idea what we were getting into. But and those are the successful ones. They're like, well, yeah, I mean, even if we had failed, we, it would have been cool that we attempted. We would have gr regretted not trying. Um, that's, I think that's a cool kind of compass to use to guide you is, you know, what would you regret not doing even if you failed, right? That the learning would, itself would be worth it but that you know, all of these projects, they're gonna take longer, they're likely going to be even harder than you expect, but they're worth doing for their own sake, regardless of outcome. I think that's a really good driver. And I said, I, I talked to you about this and all of the headaches with the permits, and it's like, it's like a fun saga, but the, um, the, the kind of takeaway that I get is like, despite, hey, we might've done a couple things differently if we're doing it again, but like no regrets. It was like a really fun experience. And that's, it's, a, it's a cool thing to have and it's a cool way to live. Um, so with that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hand it off to Q&A. We got some, some good ones in here. Um, start with uh, Lloyd Williams' question. Um, I think this kind of ties into, you know, the, started with the video gaming as far as, I like to say that the speed of your improvement in any pursuit is proportional to the tightness of your feedback loops. Um, you know, Lloyd would like to know, Nat, how do you maximize feedback loops to adapt and change? Yeah. Well, some areas it's sort of like built in, right? And that makes it easier to improve, right? So uh, like the video games is a great example and poker is a great example too, because you're getting basically immediate feedback on your decisions. Uh, you're, you know, you're going to win or lose. You're going to like make more money, less money, whatnot. And you can like evaluate pretty quickly where it gets challenging is like areas where you don't get that quick feedback loop. So SEO is actually a good example of this because you probably won't know for three, four, six months, whether or not your SEO strategy is working. So it's very hard to like evaluate uh, day to day, whether or not like what you're doing is effective. So, you know, for something like that, uh, getting like more samples, right? So one thing I really like about doing growth machine is since we're now working with like 20, 30 clients at a time, we're seeing what's working for different people in different industries, uh, like all at the same time. So we get a lot more data and that allows us to take long feedback loops, but get quicker feedback in general, because we can see, you know, what's happening with our strategy across like 30 different sites versus just one. So the feedback gets a little tighter because you have like more things to use as sources of feedback. Um, the other thing I've started doing more of is like decision tracking. So this is like a really good way to, evaluate things that you've decided in the past and then like try to figure out whether or not, or try to figure out what was good or bad about those decisions. So uh, as a simple example, whenever I decide something that I think is kind of like an important decision, right? Like that it, whenever I decide something that I know I could end up either regretting or being thankful for, I'll try to record that in my Rome database and add a decision tag to it and then give myself a task to follow up in that decision in like one, three, and six months. And then when that pops back up in my to-do list at those intervals, I can go back and look at it and say like, okay, was this a good decision? Why or why not? Uh, what would I do differently next time? Like, what can I get from this? And that's been really, really helpful for 
creating feedback loops where there might not be any or where it might take a long time to like get to the feedback loop. Cause you know, as like a simple example, we've made some bad hiring decisions at growth machine in the past. And I feel like if I, and I feel like I've learned a lot from them by going back and analyzing, you know, what like key assumptions I made at the time of hiring that ended up not being true. Like what evidence was there for those key assumptions that I should have been looking at more carefully? What evidence could I look for in the future? Uh, and that helps tighten the feedback loops a lot. Cause like for certain things, you're never going to get feedback unless you seek it out. And unless you like try to find it or you force yourself to get it. Uh, and that's like, you know, really helpful for improving your skill, especially in some of the most important domains, right? Like, uh, your, your decision-making as uh, an entrepreneur is probably like your most important skill, but you don't always get great feedback on it or the feedback you get might be murky. Right. So it's like the, the cafe is a good example of this, right? Like we, you know, in looking back on it, there are good decisions and bad decisions we made, but the fact that it's closed right now is not like a fault of ours. Right. It's like it's a global pandemic. You can't prepare for that. And it's like, is there something we could have done to, you know, prepare better against that? Like, not really. I mean, we, we already did the one thing that most other businesses are having to do now, which was like diversify to online. We were like already online. So it's like, you know, you can't look back and say like, oh, well, I shouldn't have opened a cafe because, you know, in a year we were going to be in quarantine, right? It's like, that's not helpful. Um, but I could look back and say like, okay, well, we should have talked to a lot more people who were running cafes before we did this because we just assumed, you know, I, I like in my hubris assumed that we could just figure it out and it would be inexpensive and that was wrong. And so next time I jump into something like this, I need to like take the time to really analyze it. So forcing yourself to evaluate past decisions is probably one of the best ways to tighten that feedback loop for like almost anything. If whatever you're looking for feedback on doesn't have a built-in mechanic, the, the other way is just going to be getting a coach or a professional who can help you with it. Right. It's like going back to the fitness stuff, like, like just getting a personal trainer, somebody to like, help me get in better shape and like figure out where I'm deficient and focus on improving that. It's like that time the feedback loop on so much of my like physical stuff a lot more uh, and just getting data. Right. It's like, I used to think that <clears throat> I used to think that like um, marijuana was like good for sleep because you like get tired and you like fall asleep really easily. But then you get like an aura ring and you track your sleep data and you go like, oh, wow, it's actually like really bad for sleep. Like it's actually like killing my HRV and like raising my resting heart rate. So even though it feels like it's not impeding my sleep the way alcohol is, it's actually doing the exact same thing just without the same kind of hangover. Right. So like data experts and like forced decision analysis are all pretty good tools. That's fantastic. Yeah, I would just underline a couple things there. It's, it's having a process orientation rather than a results orientation where results are only useful to the extent that they help you reevaluate your assumptions. Where, um, as you said, how can I, if I'm in this situation again or something similar, how can I make a better decision? Or given what I knew at the time, was there something else that I could have done in order to make a better decision? Would it have turned out differently? And that it's more important to focus on those, that process of making decisions rather than the results of the decisions themselves. Yeah. Um, so Nikhil is asking about the Scott Adams concept of talent stacks. Um, what's your adv advice about how to go about picking one's talent stack? Yeah, I mean, so for anybody who doesn't know, this concept is basically that instead of just getting really good at one thing, you get really good at a few things that combine uh, serendipitously. So, you know, I guess if we were going to pick one for me, or if we were going to define mine, it would probably be some combination of like writing, marketing, and I don't know how long my third one is. Sales, maybe. Um, but <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's like intuitively true, right? I don't think Scott's saying anything that surprising there. And it's like very easy to back up with uh, examples. I don't think that you can necessarily like pick. I, I think where he draws or where he goes wrong is he's using a, he's using like his talent stack is a way of understanding success retrospectively. It's not a tool for planning success like proactively. Like I don't think anybody ever sits down and says like, oh, I'm going to like define my talent stack. I'm going to get good at 
like programming, marketing and design. And then I'm going to like be successful and make a lot of money, right? Like people get really good at things that they're interested in. And then they can look back and say like, oh, you know, it was this combination of things that made me successful. But like Scott never sat down and said like, oh, I'm going to be like an okay illustrator and an okay writer and an okay comedian. And that's going to make me successful. Those are just the things that he was like interested in. And they ended up combining in like a kind of fortuitous way. So I feel like the question is more like, what are you interested in? And going back to the resonance question, like what can you spend a lot of time doing without forcing yourself to do it? Uh, and just like doubling down on those things and finding other people to, you know, cover for the areas where you're weak. Uh, Cause I, I really don't think you can like make yourself good at a skill that's not intrinsically motivating for you. It's just like, you know, if you've got super hardcore parents that might be able to beat you into being good at the violin, but like, that's not going to stick once you like leave the house, unless you have that resonance with it. So I wouldn't really worry about like building a talent stack. I would just worry about like finding the, finding ways you can like add value to other people's lives that are intrinsically motivating to you. And like, once you find those, the like stack of skills will naturally emerge. Yeah. I like this notion that innovation happens at the intersections that you have it's it's in the combination of skills that you have where if i could use you as an example in that it's it's this combination of writing and seo knowledge and marketing and brand building and putting that together and that becomes that becomes a a unique agency offering where there are many specialists who can do one of these three things but being able to combine those is something that's a unique offering um, you know, for me, taking the, the mental models from high stakes poker and combining them with peak performance and productivity. And that, that creates a kind of a unique niche and differentiation that there are many things, who, many people who can do one of the things that we can do, but there's no one who can do all the things that we can do. And so looking for ways to uniquely package that into a unique offering is a really good place to start. If you look at like almost any scientific breakthrough, they usually come from outside of that scientific field. Someone who is bringing a unique perspective to bear that, oh, how could statistics or project management or the military or, you know, Michelin star chefs have anything to bear on this problem? But it's, it's that intersection, the unique perspective brought to an, a familiar problem that usually leads to the breakthrough. Um, Christopher Harris uh, wants to know, so this uh, zero to 60, going from thinking to doing, um, what is the fastest path from idea to doing? How do, you, how do you iterate as quick as possible on the most effective thing to do? Well, no, I mean, going from thinking to doing, how do you iterate as quick as possible on the most effective thing to do? I, I guess, guess like what's what's that what's that very first thing? It's like this is something that I'd like to do. How do you go to like I'm doing it? What's what's how do, what's the very first thing to get started? Like sprinting off a starting line. Yeah, I mean, I, at least for me, I you know, so I, I think that some of this is going to be personality driven. I naturally uh, prefer like getting started as soon as possible, and so like because you you're going to learn way faster once you're actually doing something and you see what barriers you run into and then go back and like find the information to get over those hurdles right so a good example would be like i have you know some like programming books right like i've got these big like ruby on rails tutorial books and i've never gotten more than 15 percent through one of them because as soon as I get to a point where I'm like relatively self-sufficient and I can like figure stuff out on uh, stack overflow and by like asking code mentors, like that's going to make me move way faster than forcing myself through the rest of the book. So I feel like, you know, getting over that hurdle is just finding whether it's a YouTube video or a book or a coach who can like get you started to the point where you get that like escape velocity of being able to figure stuff out on your own. Right. I think like, you know, it could be a, a good analogy could be like you, you need a lot of activation energy to get into orbit. Um, but then once you're in orbit, it takes like no additional like external energy to sustain, right? Because you're already like there and you can like, you know, kind of keep going on your own. And then like additional 
uh, inputs from there have like a disproportionately large effect because you're no longer like fighting gravity in the same way you were before you got started. So if you can just like find a, a good source to like get you off the ground and it really doesn't matter what source it is, like it could be a terrible source, but as long as it's enough to get you started where you can start asking questions and like figuring things out at you, as you go, uh, that's, I think that's going to help you get over that hump a lot quicker. The, the biggest thing that I think trips people up is they, they like obsess over like reading and trying to digest everything before they get started. And that's where you can run into trouble is like thinking, Oh, I need to read, you know, 10 books on entrepreneurship before I like start a business. Um, and that's like pretty much just a form of procrastination, right? It's like, uh, cause I mean, also most entrepreneurship books are not very helpful until you've run into most of the problems in them. Right. It's like, I usually still tell people, it's like, just go read the four hour work week and then like try to do something. Like, don't let yourself read any other books. Uh, just like, you know, go start something. And, you know, once you've like lost a bunch of money or whatever, then, you know, you can start reading other books. But uh, Dan, oh gosh, what's his last name? Uh, Dan from Tropical MBA, Andrews? Yeah, I think it's Andrews uh, from Tropical yeah. MBA has this good rule of um, like, what is it? A thousand days? Where he's basically like, it's going to take you a thousand days to replace your like employed salary with like an entrepreneurial salary. Uh, and you just have to be like willing to spend a thousand days like sucking at something and like trying to figure it out before things will start to click and it'll start to work. But the longer you like are just reading books, the longer you're delaying starting that like thousand days in the same way that the longer you're reading books or, you know, like preparing to get started, the longer you're delaying doing any deliberate practice, right? Like reading is not deliberate practice. Reading is not even naive practice. Reading is like procrastination on practice. Like I love reading, right? Like <laughs> It's like one of my favorite things to do, but I know that I'm never going to learn very much from a book unless I have a very specific question that that book is answering. Um, and a lot of times reading specific books before you need them ends up not being that useful. Right. It's like I read High Output Management by Andy Grove back when I was just starting Growth Machine and had like no employees. And I was like, oh, this is kind of cool. Like, it's an interesting book, whatever. But I didn't really get anything from it. And then I went back and reread it a few months ago and I was like, wow, this is like a phenomenal book because there's so much stuff in there that's useful for learning how to be a better manager, like once you have employees. But if you're like, if you're not even running Amazon ads yet, like you haven't even tried spending a thousand dollars on Amazon ads and you're reading a bunch of blog posts on like how to optimize your Amazon ads, like you're, you're focusing on the wrong thing, right? Like it's pretty much always going to be better to go and fail at something with very little knowledge and then read stuff to help figure out where the gaps in your knowledge were than to try to read everything from the get go. Yeah. It's like, we got a couple of questions asking us for book recommendations and we shared the links there, but I, I, I hope what you guys are taking away is that the, the knowledge that you need is probably not found in a book and that a lot of times that that reading can become uh, procrastination. And I like to think about how can we turn our consumption into production? And the easiest way to do that is to have a goal, to have a project in mind. Um, in the Experiment Without Limits, I talk about my process of learning how to become a stand-up comedian and what was the fastest path to giving a, a stand-up routine on stage in front of an audience. And anything that wasn't leading towards that goal, that wasn't deliberate practice, was a waste of time, right? I could have watched a bunch of stand-up on Netflix. I could have read a bunch of books on comedy, but the fastest path was to just write jokes and practice them in front of friends over and over again. Um, you talked about programming. There's so many people who are like, oh, I'd like to learn programming. It's like, well, pick something that you want to build and you'll have to learn instrumentally how to build that via programming. That'll be the fastest way you learn. Like a lot of programming is just Googling, oh, I don't know how to do this. And then you go and do it. And then you learn through that experience rather than like you said, with high output management, like, oh, this would be interesting to know how to manage someday. Well, if you're managing someone, it's a lot more actionable. And that consumption is immediately put into production and able to put into practice what you learn immediately. And thus that feedback loop is really tight. Um, so you, Cause through action, through trying something, you get that feedback from your environment and say, oh, well, this worked, this didn't work. Here's what I would do next time. Um, and now I, I just love what you said here is like sucking is a sign of progress that like if you're not doing something that you suck at 
there's something wrong, that that's what the boundary feels like. If, if this learning, this doing feels too comfortable, it's a very good sign that you're at a local maxima, that you're not growing at the speed that you could be, and likely that you're not taking enough risks. And so I think it's being comfortable with that feeling of stretching a little bit beyond our comfort zone, because that's where the growth comes from. That's how we become more capable. And if we can learn how to learn, we can do anything. That whatever we want to accomplish, the only thing that's separating us from accomplishing that is becoming the type of person who can do that. Right? So the skill of learning how to learn allows us to jump into any domain. Um, Nat, is there anything else that you'd like to share from today? Any, any, any place that you'd like to um, send people to? Uh, no in particular. I mean, if you have any other questions, I'm definitely most responsive on Twitter. So you can ping me there. It's just at Nat Elias and, and Chris and I and all of our other uh, productivity nerd friends talk a lot on Twitter. So feel free to join in on the discussion. Uh, but yeah, this was this was a lot of fun. Is there anything else that you want to talk about uh, wrapping up on your end, Chris? Yeah, thanks. Um, so I would just like to mention, hey, this this conversation is recorded. So we're going to be sending this out in two days via email. So keep an eye out uh, from an email from Zoom. Um, and all of these conversations are hosted online at theforcingfunction.com slash lunch hour, lunch dash hour. Um, so if you'd like to go back and read this or watch it again, you can do that at any time. Um, and yeah, please, I, I always think of these as just the beginning of a conversation. So if there's something that this conversation sparked in you, if you're working on something cool and there's something that Nat and I can do to help accelerate that, you know, please reach out. Um, we're both very approachable. As I said, I think Twitter is a very good place to do so. Um, and, you know, we're here to help. We'd love to add value, whether that's knowledge or pointing you in the right direction or even just giving you permission to do something that you don't think you're quite ready for. Um, so with that, yeah, Nat, thank you so much for being here. This was, this was a blast. And yeah, so excited to, um, to hear some of these things that you're working on and to you know, see what uh, new projects you take on in the future. Yeah, thanks for having me, Chris. We'll uh, talk more soon. Cool, thanks for being here, guys. See you next time. See ya.